Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Festival Hall. Um, I hope all of you have noticed that Festival Hall is a little bit brighter than it used to be. It's uh, a little bit more sparkly and all. We've done a lot of uh, work here cleaning it up and uh, making some improvements uh, here. And, and thanks to um, Carroll Town and, and a lot of other volunteers and a lot of donors. Um, but I'd like to welcome you tonight. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming up out on such a uh, windy, blustery uh, evening. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to welcome you to our uh, 2015 Winter Spring Lecture Series. Uh, this is the first lecture of the series. And uh, we're going to welcome Teresa Preston. Um, and she uh, represents the uh, Cherenhaka uh, Indian tribe, um, which is fairly local. Um, actually, Teresa grew up around here. Her, um, so she's a, a local also. Uh, she uh, currently has a home in, in Heathsville. Teresa has served uh, from July 2008 until present uh, on the uh, Cherenhaka Tribal Heritage Foundation as their at-large board member and as financial secretary. And um, Teresa has worked and lobbied uh, with the tribe for state legislation, which was formally granted in 2010. So they are a 501c3 entity now also. Um, after the lecture, um, there will be a question and answer period. And I know a lot of you have already seen some of the artifacts that have been gathered locally at, at Presley Creek, I believe, and also other places within uh, the state of Virginia. Well, without further ado, I'm talking too much here, and uh, I would like uh, to give a warm welcome to Teresa Preston. Thank you. Many of you probably have never heard of the Indians in southeastern Virginia, known as the Charon Hawker. Next slide. They were state recognized in 2010, and they are the only Iroquois speaking nation within Virginia. The, uh, next slide. Charon Haka in Iroquois means people at the fork of the stream. Nadawa, which is where Nottaway came from, means snake, adder, or enemy. The Cherenhaka Nottaway embraced both names. They recognized their ancient name, Cherenhaka, and put Nottaway in parentheses. So we sort of run it all together when we say it. The red star on the map is where the tribe's 100 acres is located. They purchased that in 2009, and it's near the town of Cortland, just outside of Cortland. Next slide. Back in the 1600s, we had a lot of native people here in Virginia. In fact, if you had been a colonist coming into this area and you traveled around the state, you would have encountered three linguistic groups. We had the Suan, the Algonquin, which was what the Powhatans and Mattapanai Indians and the uh, Pamunkey Indians spoke. And we had Iroquois. The chart there shows the first ethno-historic contact that happened with the Cherenhaka tribe. In 1609, they sent out a search party. It was sort of 20 years too late, but they went looking for the lost colony. They lit out from Herikus, which is near today's Hopewell area, and crossed overland until they got into the river system, the Nottaway River system, which feeds down into Albemarle Sound. For those of you who know the water real good, that sort of is the back door into uh, the Roanoke Colony area it was logical to assume they might run into somebody who knew something, but they didn't. Next slide, please. On that trip to look for the lost colony, they took two Algonquin-speaking Indians from the Powhatan 
Confederation who guided them. And every time they ran into the chair in Hakka, they'd stand there and go, Natwa, Natwa. The colonials didn't speak very good any English or Indian language. They thought the Indians were calling them by their name. They didn't realize they were saying enemy. It also has been translated to mean snake or adder or somebody who doesn't speak our language because we have found the entry talking about other tribes further north. The real name of many tribal groups got changed here in the east, out in the west. Here locally, you've heard of the Chickacone Indians. That's not their real name. Sahakakon, and it has that guttural sound, which I don't do very well, was listed on the map by Captain John Smith. Now, I honestly think if he wanted to say Chickacone, he could have written it, but they got their name changed. Next slide. In 1669, they decided we needed a census of the native population. That was ordered by the House of Burgess. It was basically a nose count to see what we were up against as colonials. Next slide. And by 1676, things had heated up so much as we were running into the Tuscarora Indians who were Iroquois speakers, but very warrior-like. And they weren't taking any guff off of anybody. But the local Indians, the Pamunkey, the Mattapunai, the Nottawa, they were all enlisted to, to fight, to help fight with Bacon at Bacon's Rebellion. Uh, they were in, in on of the battle, and the, the king of the Pamunkey Indians was killed. And lo and behold, as a consolation prize, if you will, the Cherenhakanadawe were put under her dominion here in the Commonwealth. It was a token. They still lived by themselves down on their reservation land. It was just a way to try and be her friend or help her in her, her grief, I guess. I, when I read that at first, I thought it was an odd thing to do, but that's there. That's why, next slide, we have the Treaty of 1667. Next slide. And we have the reservation down in uh, Southampton County that was set up. So they were completely separate from the Pamunkey, but yet had been put under her domain. Next slide. And we had uh, tribal interpreters. They're in the records, so everything was separate. Uh, they even set up a, a way to to sell off this land after they had given it to the Indians. Next slide, please. And they were working, trying to get the native people to send their sons to the Brafferton. But what was really sort of laughable, the building you see there, which is still over in Williamsburg today, was not built for several years. They ended up at a place called Fort Christiana. Next slide. But in 1713, this tribe, even though it had uh, signed other tribal treaties with the Pamunkey and the Mattapunai also as being signatories, they actually had a contract that was signed, or a treaty that was signed with England. And it, they were the only signatories on it. It was a standalone treaty, but I find it very odd. It had a successors clause in it, almost like they sort of knew it was coming or something. Uh, the three arrows that you see there in the beaver pelts were what were tribute 
unlike a deer, the beaver pelts were the money crop at that time period. Uh, we have presented, just like the other tribes here in Virginia recognize their treaties with the deer, we have presented the last three years on the anniversary of the 299th, the 300th, and the 301st tribute of three arrows and one beaver skin <laughs> to the governor or his representative. And on the 300th anniversary, it was rather interesting. Lieutenant Governor Bill Bowling, who is of the red bowling line of Native Americans, was the recipient. And I thought that very appropriate since uh, we had Lieutenant Governor to initiate this thing when we started doing it, Lieutenant Governor, uh, almost 200 years ago, uh, and a Lieutenant Governor on the 30th or 300th anniversary. Next slide. This was the little fort that the Indians got to go to to learn their English, their Bible, and be Christianized, because the Brafferton wasn't built yet. The Brafferton got its name from a family over in England who died and in their estate planning had decreed that the funds were to buy a farm in England and that all the proceeds from that farm were to fund the building of a school for Native Americans in America or in the colonies as it was known back then. From the day that was initiated, they started funding Fort Christiana, and they also started trying to get enough money together to build the Bradford and that building that you see in Williamsburg today. But by 1775, it was so well funded, it was the envy of the rest of William and Mary. They had books, they had library, it, was, it exceeded uh, most of what William and Mary had for the rest of their classes. It was Coveted, I think, was the right word. <laughs> and in 1776, when we seceded from England, all of that stopped. On May 17th, or May 7th and 8th in 1728, William Byrd II went down through Southampton County area. Actually, he started out in the western part of Virginia and followed the Nottoway River system down. And he documented in his diary, the closest thing we have to a first-hand reporter's account of the Cheronock and Nottoway villages. Next. The Cheronock and Nottoway were recruited to fight in several wars. This one shows you the fort at uh, Fort Dunkirk, uh, where Washington, George Washington, uh, Fought, but we find in the records of March 8, 1759, where several men are named. Uh, the man by the name of Alec Scholar, his predecessor was Scholar, is on the rolls at the Brafferton. We, we find bits and traces through all of our records of, of where these people came from and he had to choose a name when he went to the Brafferton. And after being there for several days, the schoolmaster got on him. He hadn't chosen a name. He said, I'm thinking, you know, sort of important what name I choose. And I, I couldn't help but smile when I saw that he had written scholar. And he didn't spell it the way we would spell scholar today, but it was pronounced scholar. Um, next slide, please. In 1808, out of sequence with our normal 10-year census, we have a census that was required of our, the tribe, the Charon Hakanataway tribe. It was not a normal census. If your mother or father married a Charon Haka Indian and had children, they got counted. If they had married a black person or a white person, none of the children got counted. 
It was extremely prejudiced. They wanted just the names of those who were on the reservation. If you lived somewhere off the reservation, you didn't get counted. Therefore, we have 17 individuals, and it's from this list of 17 that the tribe, the Cherenaka tribe, you must be able to trace your ancestry genealogically with a blood trail, either to a mother or father that's on this list. And that's the way you become a tribal member, but you have to prove a blood relationship with family Bibles, you know, because back in that day they didn't have birth certificates. But that's where we start for the blood trail. Next slide, please. And in March 4th, 1820, John Wood, who was a professor of mathematics, and we have seen some indication he may have also been a surveyor, happened to go down to Southampton County and interview Wani Runsara, or her Christian name was Edie Turner, and he recorded a vocabulary of language from her. Thomas Jefferson collected languages, and he, he acquired this language, uh, and he sent it up to his friend, who was a lawyer and also a, a linguist, Peter de Poncier. And Peter took one look at it and said, that's not Algonquin, that's Iroquois. Now, can you believe it was that long into the history of this country before they figured out that these people spoke a different language? But that's what happened. A second recording of the language was done by the Honorable James Tresvant. And I sat there and I thought, now why would a judge take his time and effort to do that? So one day I went online and I looked him up. I wanted to find out who he was. He also served in Congress, I found out. And on his genealogical page, I found the connection. I'd already found him in the deeds. He bought up Indian land every time it came up for sale, over and over again. Here's this guy's name. But he also, as a second marriage, married Mary Blount Turner. Now, anybody who's ever looked at the Chiranaka Nottaway rolls knows that Turner is a surname on those rolls. Edie Turner was the chief, for crying out loud. Anyway, Mary Blount, Blount is a uh, name that also relates to Tuscarora, Tuscarora and Meharian Indian descent. And uh, he married her, and they moved out to Tennessee, where they're both buried now. But that was his connection, that was his hot button as to why he wanted to record the language. When you look at the two recordings, because they were both phonetically done, which I couldn't do if you paid me to do it, but they phonetically wrote the sounds down. And they're spelled identical. And I think that's rather remarkable. With one example, one exception, the name Charon Hawker. One of them puts an extra H-A on the tail end of that. So that was the only difference. Next slide, please. We find in a newspaper article in 1820 that Thomas Jefferson was quoted saying that three tribes remained in Virginia. Yet we have 11 recognized tribes today. How can that be? He named them the Pamunkey, and he said not away, but we say Chernock and not away, and Mattapanai. Do you think for one minute that these native people, all the Rappahannocks and all these other tribes, the Patawomics out of Alexandria, they didn't just dissolve into thin air, they married into the general population. I would say that probably half of you sitting in this room, if you dig out your genealogy and look it up, you have a Native American great-grandmother, great-grandfather that left their tribe and did like Pocahontas, married and assimilated into 
what was going on in her world back then. Next slide. In 1875, we find that the tribe was down to 575 acres, and they petitioned to have it divided up among the remaining tribal people. They didn't ha it was jointly owned up until that time. And we find in the records that nobody wanted to work. Why should I work if everybody else is going to get the benefit? And they wanted to be able to own it in their own name, so they, they divided it up. The last acres passed down through family members until 1952, when the Sykes family, uh, they had a, a need to sell. And it, that last piece was, was sold off back then. So now we have a tribe with no land, OK? Next slide. Well, we still have the history. Part of that history is the hand site. This is a map showing, it's just below Franklin, by the way. Franklin is not on this page, but if it were, it would be right up in, in this area. And this river is the, um, the Nottoway River. All of those little numbers on there represent a site. Now here in Virginia, if you see a 44 in front of a number in a museum next to an artifact, be aware that that artifact came from Virginia. That's what that number means. The next code in this case is a SN that stands for Southampton County. Up here in Northumberland, you would find a NB. And the last part is the site number that was assigned to each of the sites. And that particular excavation, they recorded a large number of sites. They had volunteers that got out and went all up and down the river, interviewed people, and they recorded these sites. The site that was finally excavated was 44SN22. It was called the hand site. It was named after the little post office, but the post office was, was called Handsome. Well, they thought it would be really, really dumb to name it the Handsome site, so they shortened it and called it the hand site. And I told Russell Darden, I said that was still a dumb name for it. But anyway, they excavated. Next slide, please. And what they found, which would not be done today, legislation has been passed, but they excavated 131 tribal remains. I was privileged to go with the tribe in 2008, before I was ever even a board member, and view the 131 skeletal remains that's stored at the Smithsonian. You had to make an appointment months in advance. They set it up, they have this little blue room, which is not very large, and you had all the way around the room, three sides, you had skeletal remains. Chief Brown is pictured in front here with the vice chief. They were smudging, which is the way they bless an area or a ceremony. They were doing a smudging there with uh, sage and sweet grass. I wasn't even related to these people, and I got teary-eyed. Can you imagine going and looking at the bones of your ancestors? I would wager that many of you don't even know where your ancestors are buried. Or they might be buried out in the field somewhere, like one of mine is down at Corinth. We don't know where the grave is anymore. Tree's gone. It's part of the field now. But these people went and saw their ancestors. Among the people that they excavated was a lady, a European lady. She was buried with her scissors, her comb, 
and part of her sewing kit. The sewing kit and the comb are housed up at the Department of Historic Resources in Richmond, Virginia. Next slide. As are the artifacts that came from that site. And you'll notice the little numbers on each one of these points to identify where they came from. Next slide. And for two years, we worked with the department to get a marker put up to commemorate this burial ground that had been removed. And next slide. And we finally did get it. Um, it says, east of here near the Nottoway River stood a late woodland Indian village settlement occupied intermittently circa 8700 to 1650 and long claimed by the Chernhock and Nottoway. Excavated in the 1960s, occupational phases included features such as a fortified town and burials in an area flanked by the Iroquois Chernhock and Nottoway and Meharan to the north and northwest, and by Algonquin, Wyanoaks, Nansman, and Choanoak tribes to the northeast and south, the site shows influences from both linguistic groups, which may indicate both trade and use by different groups at different times. Archaeologists also found 17th century European iron scissors and hand-wrought nails. Now remember when they went looking for the lost colony? Maybe they asked the wrong question. Were any of them ever here and are they dead now or are they alive? But I suspect I would dearly love to see them do some DNA testing on that woman and see if she's from that lost colony. She had to come from somewhere. And this is right up the road or right up the stream <laughs> from the Lost Colony area. Next slide. In 2002, the tribe formally reorganized. They had always known who they were. They'd get together for family reunions. But they got to talking and said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could actually be organized as a group? So they did it. And they held their first powwow. And if you come to the powwow, these are some shots that I've taken over various powwows, but that's representative of what you'll see. Next slide. In 2005, I went to the first powwow and took artifacts like we did tonight. And we partnered with them. The chief enrolled, he's a life member of the Archaeological Society of Virginia. I signed him up. <laughs> and. Uh, we have been doing presentations with them ever since because what better way to present educational things to a community but to its own native community. To my knowledge, they're the only tribe in Virginia that does this right now. We hope others will follow. Next slide. We've done numerous native presentations. The left hand Square is up in Northern Virginia at our Northern Virginia Archaeological Society chapter. Down in the, in the left-hand corner is at the Navy for their um, diversification day. The other two right-hand slides, upper and lower, are with the Daughters of the American Revolution down in Virginia Beach. Next slide, please. And then I had the privilege of driving the chief to Washington, D.C. for this presentation. He did a fine job and he reminded those people there from the West that none of the tribes in Virginia are federally recognized. And they, they pretend they had never known that. I find that hard to believe. I think they did know it, but it was just a reminder that we're still not federally recognized. Next slide. Yeah, I've got a date wrong there. I've got 2013. It was 2009 that we acquired 100 acres of land. It was in the vicinity of where the square track had been estimated to have been. 
and it's down in the Cortland area. Next slide. This is the actual survey of it. And the land is titled in the name of the Chiron Hakunatawe Heritage, Tribal Heritage Foundation Incorporated, a 501c3. Next. It was founded, the Heritage Foundation was founded to be charitable, religious, and educational. The chief is a Baptist minister, and the tribe was recorded back when they did the, uh, the language. They asked Edie Turner, what do you say for God? What, what's the word? And she said, hunte. And I said, well, what's the word for the Christian God? And she said, oh, Quaker hunte. The Quakers were the ones who went into that area of the county and brought Christianity to the Indians. And they had no trouble grasping it because if you look at the numbers in their language, hunte means one. I've often thought the one. <laughs> next, next, please. And on 2009, March 20th, we closed on that land and celebrated and danced. Next. That's the chief offering the peace pipe to the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west. Next. And that same year, he went and presented a peaky belt. Peaky is the word for bead, beaded belt, uh, to the Virginia Council of Indians, which is now no more, it's defunct. And he referenced the long relationship with the Pamunkey Indian tribe with the treaties of 1646 and 1677, because we were trying to get the VCI to recognize the tribe. And he was using that to remind them that we were signatories on the treaty. You know, we had every right to be in the VCI, but yet they had set their criteria so high, just like the federal Indian tribes. Criteria is so high that if they had to do it themselves, they couldn't pass the criteria. So the three tribes that were acknowledged and state recognized in 2010, did it like the other eight tribes. They went before the General Assembly, and that's how they got it done. Anytime you have 20 years of an organization and no new members, something was wrong. And so they took their criteria up to the General Assembly and presented their case, and they were awarded state recognition. Next. This is an aerial shot of the tribal land as it appears today. And when we bought it, it was all wooded. It had 30-year pines on it. We bought it, cut the pines, paid a good portion of the mortgage off. The rest of the money came from tribal members who contributed. Under the Heritage Foundation, it's tax deductible. That's why they set it up that way. Next slide. This is what they have proposed to do, and a good amount of this is now in place. All of the trails are in. The, some of the ponds are in. We're now getting to the point where we want to get electricity established. Next slide. If you were to come down there, the first indication you're getting there is that plaque which is out at the end of the road. And then you drive down this long road and you come to the rail fence, you cross this stream, and you'll see the, the sign saying Tribal Village, pa Tribal Palisade Village. Next slide. They built a Palisade Village, a replica. The chief had walked the land, he had picked it out, and uh, we planted a Three Sisters Gardens, the corn, the bean, and the squash, and uh, started digging holes to put the posts in. Next slide. 
Dominion Power gave a $25,000 grant to the tribe called a Complete the Gap grant. And uh, that helped with the funding of putting in the Palisade Village. Next slide. That's the village as it stands today. And if you come, particularly in November, if you come, we have a school day. We have all of this operational with the fires going and skins out and what have you. Next slide. We've had presentations uh, for the school day twice. It was very well attended. 800 children the first year, over 1,100 the second year. Our third year will be in November of 2015. Next slide. The trails have got markers which give you the signage for the berries and the cactus in their language, and then the rest is in English, of course, but gives you the original name. Next slide. We planted 20,000 longleaf pine, which were indigenous to Virginia when the colonials first got here to reestablish that, and those trees are doing real good. Next slide. By July 27th, 2013, we had a mortgage burning ceremony. That was a very joyous occasion. The land is now paid for, and the next chapter begins, getting the rest of the stuff built. Next slide. This is a shot of the school day. The stands were full of children, and they were extremely attentive. Next slide. We want to build a museum and a wellness and worship center. That's going to be one of the long-term projects. Next slide. There's a close-up of the museum and the worship center. Next slide. And so I invite you to come to the 2015 Chernock Kanataway Inter-Tribal <coughs> Pow Wows. The dates are up there for you to read. If you come, you will see Native people from out west, from South America. We have the Aztec dancers. Uh, that's why it's called an inter-tribal. We welcome all to come. If you're an American veteran, you'll get invited to come into the ring and be honored, regardless of whether you're Native or not. Next slide. And I invite you to go to their website, www.charenhaka.notaway.org. But if you just Google Notaway, it'll pull it up. Now, there is another tribe. They call themselves the Notaway of Virginia Incorporated. They were once part of this tribe, but they broke off in 2010. So you might pull their site up when you pull this one up, but we have the Charenhaka name for our site. We're also on Facebook, and I invite you to come see us and like us, and you'll get all the, the updates and, and know what's going on if you want to follow our progress. Next slide. And I'd like to thank Thank you for inviting me. Questions? Yes. You talked about wellness center. What does the wellness center mean to the Charanaka tribe? Among the indigenous people of this country, there's a very extremely high rate of diabetes. That would be one of the things that they would encourage people to come in and at least get it identified. It would not be a center like you would think of a doctor's office type thing, but we would have wellness programs 
And that plan has not been fully laid out and implemented, so I can't give you much of an answer, but I know that's one of the things that they want to target is the diabetes. Oh. <laughs> um, back in 1960, I think is what I read on one of the things that I picked up over there, why did they get rid of that burial site? Back in the 60s, there were no federal restrictions on going in and digging up Native American burial sites. There is now. This tribe holds no ill will. They realize that it was not intentional to desecrate the site. And there, that's the way most tribes look at it. It was to gain information. And instead of harboring ill will, they have embraced archaeology, knowing that there are federal protections in. And now if we find any bones, we don't proceed. We avoid them and leave them interred. One of the uh, arrowheads back there, a large one, had a dead B, like boy, and P, like Paul. What is that? It's a way of dating things. It means before present. It keeps, see, BC, you have to add 2,015 years to it to get the true date or the true number of years. If you date it before present, you don't have to do that math. Uh, the handsome site that you're talking about, that was really discovered when they were putting a highway through toward Newsom's, that big bridge that they put in. A lot of that was there discovered. There was one that was discovered, and that was sort of interesting. I've got the, the actual report on it. Uh, they had archaeologists come out from up north, not even Virginia archaeologists, they did a phase one study, said there wasn't anything there. They get the bulldozers in there and they start digging up bones. So they had to stop all the operations and peruse the site and remove what had been disturbed. I mean, once it was disturbed, it was disturbed, but they had to do a, a report and everything. And what was in the way got removed. And they did file a report, so. They just didn't dig far enough down. Most of your phase one studies goes, what, less than a foot, Wayne? Um, while I'm at it, let me introduce Wayne Edwards. He is our current president of the Nanzaman chapter of the Archaeological Society of Virginia. I'm a past president of it. And Wayne has brought his artifacts from his farm in Southampton County. I've brought artifacts that came down to me from Irwin Bray, who was a local farmer here in the region. He collected those artifacts when he was a little boy out hoeing the weeds barefoot, and he picked them up in self-defense because if you stepped on them, you'd cut your foot. And after a while, he got enough that his daddy fixed a parrot and monkey baking powder box to store them in, and that box is sitting over there as well. Uh, parrot and monkey, don't ask me what it has to do with baking powder, but uh, it's out of Baltimore, Maryland from the stamp on the side. And uh, for people who collect boxes, I went online, they had boxes there of that type. It was, it, the value of the box is about a $200 box. I guess not too many of them got saved, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody else has one somewhere anyway. You'd mentioned that uh, the tribes in Virginia still are trying to get federal recognition. I know that this has been going on for a number of years. Uh, what seems to be the, the difficulty with our Congress in recognizing Virginia, the oldest colony, and is, is this, does the same problem exist in some of the other eastern uh, coastal areas with the early tribes, uh, such as in Massachusetts, uh, in Delaware, and so forth. There are tribes north of here in the 
Connecticut and New York, for, and further north, that are federally recognized. So the answer to that is no. There's no problem there. Down here in Virginia, we had a, a lot of um, problems when a man by the name of Walter Plecker became our first fellow to head up the Bureau of Vital Statistics in Richmond. And this occurred back after the turn of the century. I forget the exact year, but it, it was very early on in the century. And he held that position forever. He was sort of like Hoover in the FBI. This guy held on to this position for years until he died in a tragic car accident, I believe in 1954. But he, in his world, you were either black or white. There was no room for Indians. And if you had one drop of Indian blood, you got labeled black. So if you go looking for your native ancestors, at the Library of Virginia, you need to go into the files for the blacks and mulattoes of Virginia. That's where you'll find the ancestors listed. The chief had done that, he kept going up there and not finding anything, and finally one of the librarians clued him in as to where it was gonna be found. Plecker was famous for a couple of things. He'd write the board, the clerk of court of the county, and he'd have a list of these people who were Native American, and he had them on that list. He said, don't let them be officials, don't let them be this, don't let them be that. He was also famous for altering birth records. An I can be made into an M real easy, and that's what happened. They would change it to mulatto. In my own family, now, when I grew up here in Northumberland, it never dawned on me I might have any native blood in me. Um, my grandfather, though, said that his grandmother was Native American. So when I started doing genealogy, I got all the way up to Warsaw <clears throat> one day and went in the clerk's office and found a marriage certificate for this grandmother. And I thought it sort of odd because it was like she just popped out of nowhere. It had Henrietta Bowman, but she just married a Bowman. No mother, no father. And I thought that's strange, but at 14, you don't really know how strange it is. You don't know what you found. It was years later that we got an inkling of where she may have come from. We don't know for sure, but my cousin, who is, he's actually my second cousin. He's married an Australian girl, lives down in Australia. And he's now retired and works at the British Museum for tall ships. And he emailed me one day and said, you'll never guess what I found. I found Captain Delano's log to one of his trips down the East Coast. And he said, and in it, they took 10 Seneca women on board. And I said, well, have you found any, you know, any place they took them to or let them off? He said, no. I said, well, do you have a list of the ship's officers? And he said, not with me, but I can get them. So he sent them to me in a, another email and bingo. <laughs> Lieutenant Bowman and that marriage certificate I found when I was 14. The only thing I need to do is go back and check the dates. But somewhere, those Seneca women ended up somewhere down this East Coast area, and I think that's where my great-great-grandmother came from. So if that's true, I would then be 116 Seneca. If it's not, it's still an interesting thing to know about. <laughs> But um, they never talked about being Native, and the reason was Mr. Delano had had three wives. He had eight children by each wife. The first two died in childbirth. That's 24 children. The last wife was the daughter of this Native American grandmother. Now, what would have happened to those children if it had been known in the community that they had 
native blood. They would have gone to a different school from the other 16 children. That's why you didn't talk about it. That's why at 89 years of age, I had to pry it out of my great aunt, what little bit she would tell me. And my grandfather, being the baby in the family, the baby of the boys anyway, he didn't know hardly anything other than she was Native American. So a lot of the, the families here in Northumberland may have a, a similar story in their genealogical record. I will say this, we were one of the few areas to ever set up a reservation very, very early on. And they scooped up all the Indians, the, the Chickacones or Sahakacons, the Wicomico Indians, and put them on a reservation down on what is today in Lancaster County known as Indian Creek. We know that they weren't a very happy bunch because they had to put a constable down there to keep the peace. So they fought among themselves. And for years I wondered why on the census books that I have, two great big volumes that have come down through a tribal member that's done research here in Virginia on the Native Americans of, of Virginia, why there were no entries for Northumberland County or Lancaster County. And I found out later that a lot of these Native people didn't want to live on the reservation. They packed up and went out and joined the Cherokee out in the western part of the state. They just went west. And of course, that's a whole different story because even now the Cherokee here in Virginia are trying to get recognized. It's a small band. They hid out in the mountains and they blended in. They didn't go down into Tennessee. They didn't follow on the Trail of Tears. But they're there nonetheless. But they're not even state recognized, much less federal. So there's still a lot of inequities going on among the tribal communities. I feel that this tribe with their history, we, in 2002, I believe it was, he filed an intent to be federally recognized and you have so many years to get it in because it takes a while to gather the data and the information that they ask for. And this is so scattered, it's not like it's all in a neat little book. You've got to go to the six volumes of the minutes of the House of Burgesses. You've got to have your language documented. You've got to have so many things. But we're fortunate. If you go to the website, you'll see the language. And if I were to walk in and it were morning, I'd be able to say, Oh, see you. Or Quatsatsitang which means good morning in Iroquois. That's a mouthful, isn't it? My tribal name, by the way, is Tethraki Deshu. Tethraki means moon, and Deshu means star. And one of the words that we have that I can teach you, and I guarantee you'll be able to remember it, is the word cheer. Cheer means dog in Iroquois. Anybody's ever had a dog? They are cheerful and cheer you up and everything. And uh, you'll be able to see all of the words that are recorded on the, the website for the language if you have a curiosity. I will say this, one of the words that clued Peter de Poncier into the fact that we might have the original Iroquois language or the mother tongue of the Iroquois right here in Southeast Virginia was the word Deshu, which means star. Or not star, I'm sorry, Ahita, which means sun, same thing, but different connotation. Ahita down here and up north they say Hita. They've dropped the uh off of it much like we do in our language when we say, I'll info you on that. Or we shorten the word comparable and we'll say, well, here are the comps, you know. Language evolves, 
So if they came down during the Ice Age and hunkered around down here to keep from freezing to death and then went back up north, who's to say a remnant didn't stay behind? We know the glacier came down as far as mid-Virginia, and that may be where it came from. We don't know. We'll probably never know for sure, but that was his theory on the language. At least you can probably hear me. Hello. Um, how accurate is genetic testing? Earlier tonight you said many of us probably have native background. If we had genetic testing, how accurate would that be to the populations that were available in Virginia? Excellent question that I don't know the answer to. They have to have a database and they start with no Native American people. And I guess they just keep building from there, but I really don't know. That's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> well, I think that um, we'll wrap this up this evening. I know there's some wonderful questions and we've learned quite a bit. Um, I invite all of you to stay a, a little while and, and finish up the coffee and, and uh, snacks and definitely uh, spend a little bit of time looking at the artifacts that uh, uh, Teresa and Walter brought uh, to display. Uh, and if you have any other questions, then um, let's see, please feel free to, to ask at that I time. would like to invite any teachers to come over and identify yourself because we have a free gift for you. And if you are a member of a library, as well, come over. Uh, we also have book markers with the history of the tribe. We have a few of the um, teacher's guides, which have the, on the back side, they have all the websites that have lesson plans already done for Native American studies. So, those are free. Mm -hmm.